All right, and we're live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Facilitating XYZ Live. Uh, my name is Sam Killerman, and I'm one of the co-hosts of this show. I'm one of the co-facilitators of Facilitating XYZ, which is a free online resource for all facilitators. This show is part of that resource in this show. It's my job and it's Meg's job to um, interview facilitators we admire and do everything we can to learn from them and hopefully learn from them in a way that benefits all facilitators. So with that said, our special guest or our, ho or our, our guest today that we're really excited to interview is Nate Follin. Um, he'll introduce himself in a little bit, but first, Meg, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Meg Bolger. I'm one of the other co-facilitators of Facilitating XYZ and one of the co-hosts of this show. And I'm really excited uh, to connect with Nate today. Nate and I have like crossed paths, I don't know how many years, but a lot. And I don't know if we've ever like ended up having a full conversation until uh, this opportunity where now we're across the country from each other and uh, I get to dig into your brain for like two hours so um, or however long we're here together. So I'm really excited about that. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to, to get into it. So Nate, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself to kick us off. Whew. Meg, that's a loaded question. Uh, first, though, I just want to say, yeah, it, it's been um, great to connect with you, Meg, prior to this and now Sam, and just uh, that I'm so grateful to be on this show, and what a great concept. So um, it was an honor to be a part of the lineup this week, and hope for more folks will tune into the others that are live, and go back and see the other uh, shows that have been um, documented as well. Myself, uh, gosh, there's so many things that come to mind when you ask that, trying to be brief. Um, certainly a son, a father, and a dad, husband, and um, or father and dad, same thing. How about that? Um, on the professional side, as a trainer, an author, um, group facilitator, a consultant. Um, there's more to that, uh, but it's I tend to be wearing a lot of different hats or working in a lot of different spaces, and we can unpack that if you want. Um, but that's the brief of it. Yeah, we'll definitely unpack it. Um, my my first question that I always love asking people is, what led to them being here? So, like, how did you get here? And you can interpret that as like sitting in front of your computer talking to us or doing the work that you're doing. Um, what led to you being here? Hmm. <sighs> in one word, curiosity. Ah. Uh, and so I guess with that, there is a curiosity of what comes. I hold a belief that um, with, with all of our interactions and especially certain interactions and the more that we have some intention to those, that there's certain information, certain experience, certain moments that are only accessible through those interactions. Meaning whatever happens in this interview uh, between the three of us and all those that are watching and so on, um, may only happen because of this moment. And that's a belief I hold in my life, and that's a belief I hold when I'm facilitating groups. And it's magical, right? We've, maybe some of us have had those experiences. So, uh, so there's a curiosity to see what happens when we start interacting. Yeah. I, I like, ugh, I already want to dig into that, and, and I'm going to hold myself back a little bit, because I would love to know, like, how did you start facilitating? Like most of us didn't grow up being like, oh, I want to be a facilitator. So like, how did, how did you end up facilitating if that was an end up or how did you come into that um, work? Yeah. So me either, I didn't know facilitation, whatever that is, existed, right? Um, and to do it experientially or hands-on and interactively, I didn't know that existed. Um, and it's, it's, maybe there's a story other people can relate to, but uh, I've continued in my life not to know what I've wanted to do. Yet, in the moment, I'm really clear about what I'm doing. So I'm generally not a planner. Um, I, I think the word that I often can relate to is being a drifter. However, uh, in that drifting, there's such great things. It's like going out for a paddle. I, I sea kayak. Um, it's been a little bit, but in sea kayaking, especially in the ocean, you just you have so many opportunities and you might have a clear path, but you might see something that draws you in, so you go check it out. Uh, so in a similar way, a little more specifically, um, I'll give my timeline kind of a buckets because I think that's what brought me here, especially not knowing. Um, 
the first one might may seem odd to people, may not. It makes a lot of sense to me, and it took me a little while to realize this, but my parents owned and operated a restaurant for 25 years, and the staff that were there, you know, my mom ran the front of the house. She was a hostess, um, worked the, you know, guiding the serving crew. Um, my dad ran the back of the house, working off the grill and the line of the food prep and delivery. And we certainly had a team, but we were a family in terms of the staff. Uh, and that started, you know, there's pictures of me as a kid peeling carrots and sorting silverware. Um, and then eventually working as a young teen up through uh, probably early 20s. And I think the piece that connects to facilitation and um, interpersonal dynamics um, and our own personal dynamics of self-awareness is my uncle, uh, especially who was also on the line cooking, would often teach me to read what was going on uh, on the floor, on the dining room floor. So he would say, um, so let's watch. Let's watch when we're going to get busy. And what are the things, what are the indicators that let us know that we're going to be busy here with the food prep. So what were we doing? Watching the servers coming with drink orders or appetizer orders. And once you see five, 10, 15, 20 tickets going in, right? Slips for the, uh, you know, it's electronic now. Um, going into the bar or coming into us for appetizers, you could anticipate what's that typical time, about 20, 30 minutes. He said, those slips are coming in soon. We don't have to go out to know what's going on. So it was a lot of, coaching and guidance around that and it almost became a game. Mm. There was also the flip side as managing my own stress, watching my parents and everyone that worked there manage stress when the game was on, full tilt, if you had a full dining room, which happened, plus a, a banquet of 300, 350 people. Sure. The guideline was everything goes out hot and everyone eats within 10 minutes for the banquets. That's a pretty daunting task. Um, so that's the early piece. Do you want me to continue with it or do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, I want you to continue in a second, but I'm curious, to can you go back before that? So you said that was like up until your early 20s. Can you remember any meaningful experiences you had as a participant in what you would now call facilitation or anything that like comes out in your mind or anything that you've you've connected your work back to? Um, it's an interesting one. I've been a camp counselor, but I never went to camp. Ah. Although I might have snuck into camp on occasion to play wiffle ball. <laughs> All right. um, I, you know, I worked with Project Adventure, and which might be noted for challenge courses in adventure education. Uh, and we can dig into that some more later. Um, but I had experienced as a participant a challenge course twice okay. uh, as a camp counselor. I didn't know what it was about, but I saw it and recommended to our camp director that, hey, this might be a good thing to do for us as a team. So um, one of the first experiences as a participant was on a challenge course. For me as a challenge course? Yeah. Um, there were two. Uh, I grew up in North Attleboro, Massachusetts, a bit south of Boston. And there's the Hockamock YMCA in North Attleboro, and then there's the Attleboro YMCA. And okay. it was, you know, the first one I think was North Attleboro. Um, which I remember just a, a, a clear picture of being up on a catwalk, right? A horizontal beam across two trees, you've climbed up. And uh, once you want to cross, the invitation is what, um, do you want to go down slow or fast? <laughs> Which meant you could either jump off and get like a quick ride and a drop or, uh, <laughs> or just a more traditional slow ride. Um, I don't recall what I did. Uh, I was probably focused on like, just being at height and managing myself, my emotions. Okay. Uh, the Atterboro Y, I remember um, the game Gotcha. So if you know Gotcha, this game where you're inviting people to put palms out and in a circle and to put their index finger in a palm around around the circle and on the word Gotcha or Go, whatever it is, you're trying to catch the finger that's being in a palm and also being evaded and being caught. That run and shout where you name your your, your yell your name as long as you can, running as far as you can. Um, those in terms of games, like, wow, this is amazing and fun, uh, culminating with jumping off a um, leap of faith, right? A big telephone pole in the ground, 25, 30 feet high. Um, 
trusting that the belay is going to work. I didn't know what belaying was then. It was just like you go up and you jump, right? And you try to grab the trapeze. Those were pretty significant um, in terms of at least an initial taste of it. Um, so th that's, that's, that would be akin to this stuff. That's probably my participant experience. Yeah. Cool. What the, so what's interesting is the, well, maybe it's not interesting. Maybe this is just like really normal. Um, so gotcha and like the <laughs> run and scream your name. Although I think for me when I did it, it was just scream, like just like, yeah. ah. um, yeah. like those were some of my first experiences with, I don't know if we would call that experiential ed or just like, um, big interactive games like that you could do with lots of people and my question is like I when you said those things like a lot of like emotions come up of like excitement and connection and joy and like also being out of your head right and just being really focused on the physical like mm -hmm. what what do you feel is significant like when you think about those memories like what are the first what are the emotions that come up of like, man, that's what, that was so significant. Like what was significant about it for you? Um, well, I would say this, what, what's coming up for me is there was significance to those moments that it was fun, that it was playful, that it was engaging. Um, what's coming up more, like even more than that was the bigger picture that that was couched in. And what it was, was after and actually a little bit of overlapping, but um, as an early teen, sorry, late teens, early 20s, I worked as a camp counselor through my town's park and rec department, through the, yeah, through North Attleboro Park and Rec. And there was a director there, Tony Calcia, who has become um, a tremendous friend and uh, mentor. And part of those challenge course experiences were him as a director listening to a younger staff around what we thought would be helpful for us to develop as staff to serve the youth in our town. Um, and so Tony had, a, had a, um, a strong philosophy about building relationships and empowering people, and specifically in that scenario is empowering youth. Us youth being late teens, early 20s, empowered to lead, to um, impact younger um, people and the, it, that's such a key thing. Um, and even mo the strongest thing with that is that Tony walked his talk. Um, he also uh, just, I recall a moment, it was like sophomore year for me in high school that was really challenging, right? Up until this point, um, things seemed pretty good for me, but I was kind of hit a, a harder spot in my life and had some challenges and Tony as a guide and mentor was someone that listened so the most significant thing yeah we can talk about the activity of running and screaming and playing gotcha and jumping off of the the leap of faith all good but what it was was you had an adult in the community and now you know in that case becoming a good friend um, who really listened to someone that was struggling Let's uh, let's talk about that more. I, you know, we were talking about this before, and I think it's it's something that is so core to facilitation, and <clears throat> not something that a lot of people maybe get the opportunity to spend a lot of time intentionally learning about listening, right? Like listening is is so core to effective facilitation and and relationship building and lots of other things. Um, what was it about the way that he listened to you when you look back on it that was important or that? that was different maybe, that was exceptional in a way that you weren't otherwise listened to? Yeah, I think the piece for me was um, the topic, aside from life in general, was focused on religion, right? And I grew up Catholic, and um, I can recall furthest back, kind of second grade, asking sort of the existence questions. Where do we come from? Who or what is God? What do I believe? So I kind of held that from that time period and kind of worked through. I did CCD classes, and it was something that um, in, in junior high or middle school really emerged as something that I felt that I needed to shift. I wasn't believing what had been told to me or um, 
you know, what I was brought up in, which is a hard thing, right? Because it's like, this is my family. This is our culture. This is who we are in some ways, but it wasn't me. So working through that and um, having someone simply listen to that perspective, not judge it, um, in a way, I felt pretty alone in that. Like at that time, it was almost like, I must be the only person that isn't quite sure whether God exists or not, or that Catholicism is for me or not for me, right? <laughs> or any, even any religion at all. I didn't know much of what existed, right. um, but I knew that this wasn't quite right. And to have someone say, that's okay. And also to have someone say, you know, I'm not sure either. So a personal connection and then, you know, there were times where, um, you know, it might have been a, a reference to a song. Like, we, we love music. Connect, Tony and I connected through songs. So there's certain songs um, that we shared, right? One of them is uh, Indigo Girls, Closer to Fine. Um, the less I seek a source to one definitive, the further I am or the closer I am to fine. And uh, that's a perspective. And that, that whole piece for me um, has evolved and grown over the years. But in that moment... I didn't feel judged. I felt heard, um, felt validated for the feelings. He wasn't affirming that it was right or wrong. It was just, it's okay to feel this way and you're not alone. Yeah. And he related in, right? And connected it to a shared experience that you had through the Indigo Girls. Like that's, I mean, the, so many of those little elements are things that uh, without any one of those things that may not have gone well and definitely may not have been like a very like powerful or transformative experience right exactly yep. yeah that's, that's incredible i was thinking about too when you were when you were saying all of that like we think of listening as um i don't know like you you need to listen to people right as if that's a singular task and but the like but and not judge them and relate into them and validate what they're saying and connect to them personally right like those aren't the we don't always say those other things as if listening is what's important right and what was striking me is that if if i mean you can't necessarily do those other things without the listening piece right like you need to have that in order to say oh you're struck okay like it, it's okay right like in order to relate in or in order to validate you need to first listen but it's only a first step it is not the end step um, that's what was really striking me about what you were saying. Mm. And I think that like shows up so much, um, on a consistent basis, like both in facilitation and, and more broadly in life, which is why <laughs> I don't see those as like two separate things. Right. Mm. Um, but instead very, very much related. Absolutely. Um, listening such a practice. A, pra you know if oh. a practice, can you what do you mean by that? Um, what I mean by practice is that it, it um, it's something to work on. It's something to continue to do over and over again and learn from when you're doing it well and when you're not doing it well. It helps to have that awareness yourself and it helps to have other people provide some feedback on how you're doing with your practice. Um, and in such a way you can think about other areas of some people's lives, maybe like a yoga practice or a meditation practice or band practice, right? Practicing for athletics, whatever it might be, is that not, not a rehearsal, like I'm going to practice listening. Like uh, <laughs> I just watched a, a great TED Talk, um, Celeste Headley, on how to have, um, I forget the, the title of it, but something around conversations and the concern that our ability to have conversations like really engaging authentic conversations is dwindling a little bit. And I love that she just started off with this idea of we know that, well, what's active listening, right? Is eye contact, nodding yes, like showing intent that you are listening. And she said, if you're doing all that, it's crap. Like <laughs> I, with, with respect to Celeste, I think she's, she's speaking to if you are, um, Doing that, I would say for a longer period of time, this is not Celeste Headley's terms, but my take on it is that if you're doing that for a long period of time, if you're faking listening, um, or if you're, you know, it's like if you need to manage distraction, that, that you're not listening, right? 
Yeah. So it's, it's this idea of um, been using this concept lately with different groups that I work with of learning, doing, being. So we learn something, we understand it cognitively. Many of us have gone through that for uh, traditional education, right? Cognitively, we've learned something. And at this point, there's so much information to know online resources, books, and so on. Okay. Our, our, our knowing of people or from people. There's something different between learning something and being able to do it. And that's where the practice comes in. And oftentimes in the practice, it's a little more mechanical, right? I, I use that with groups that I use that are learning to facilitate when I train them to learn how to facilitate, um, to, to develop the skills of listening or giving feedback or whatever it might be, that initially it's going to feel mechanical, almost fake, right? It's like, oh, this isn't me. I don't, I don't know in my head yes, or I don't uh, make eye contact like this all the time. And you got to start somewhere to practice it, and it'll feel a little bit awkward until the point where we're not even thinking about it. It doesn't feel mechanical anymore. It's just who we are. It becomes that habitual like like a habit-based behavior, right? Habitual behavior is that it's so us. That's just what we do. Yeah. So you talked about like working with groups on on um, setting up like plans for becoming better listeners, or just talking about like you know this isn't just this abstract thing that you either good are good at or not good at, right? Like there is a way to practice this. Yeah. And I love that you mentioned earlier you were like like a yoga practice or like a meditation practice. So what is listening practice look like? Like there's not an app, right? Like I've got Calm for meditation or I can go to the, the rooftop of Whole Foods in Austin. I was just there yesterday where there's yoga. Um, how does one practice um, listening? Like what, what, what does that look like? Oh, and I'd love your take on this too, either of you, um, if, if this resonates with you. For me, it's, um, it's, it's an everyday day-to-day -day thing. And it's one of those things that I know some days that um, the practice of listening, maybe maybe for people that anything they're doing, again, those different areas of practice, yoga or working for athletics, whatever, you feel really good and you know you're kind of on. Um, so, so, so sometimes the practice is knowing like that was effective listening, known by someone being able to share back what they heard and you say, yeah, that's what I was conveying. You heard it. Thanks for getting it back to me. Um, or someone take an action based on uh, a message. And when you're a facilitator or a trainer in this work, there's so many things that we are delivering, um, which is, you know, it's not so much the listening of it. Um, although I would say it is because what you are sending needs to connect to what uh, you're listening to. And a group can be entirely silent, but they're telling you so much. So day-to-day uh, -day facilitation training work is before I'm sending a message, message uh, the hope is that I am listening to the group even if they're not talking or saying much. There's the body language, there's the, the feel or the energy. Um, there's so many layers of listening. Um, but then certainly the piece uh, of, of back to the daily practice is, is asking someone, how am I doing? There's also the piece of someone, uh, many people in my lives, just being really direct, saying, you aren't listening. This ranges from a few years ago. I remember my son Kai is now, um, he'll be uh, four Saturday, and uh, which is exciting, and he's, he's jazzed about that. <laughs> but I remember like when he was about two, he would do this thing if we're playing, if I was not listening or if I was not paying attention, feedback looked like this. Right, so his hand literally would come up and move his head, so that he I was with him. Oh, he grabbed I, your head. He would move my head. Sorry, yeah, I was yeah. not grabbing Kai's head. Yeah, <laughs> but he would literally like bring my head to focus, and sometimes it was eye to eye with him. Sometimes it was just no, look over here because I'm playing with something. So, the practice is um, being effective in it and not being effective. And either yourself telling you that wasn't very effective listening and other people telling you that wasn't effective or that was effective. Um, I can't help but think of my wife, Michelle, as well. Same thing. There are times where she wants to tell me something and there's moments where it's like, nope, you're not listening right now. And it's, yeah. And either I'll say, no, no, I'm listening. It's like, there's the practice of it. That was not effective. And 
we've talked about those moments and those are the times where it's like, no, I'm really listening. Um, so feedback is helpful. Self-awareness is helpful. Um, yeah. And being aware of it each day. I, I, I love when you said like, no, no, no I'm listening. Basically anytime you say that there was a gap, right? And either it was a gap in the actual listening, right? Like, um, no, no, I'm listening. That's like half the time. We're not saying that for the other people. We're saying that to remind ourselves. Um, but I think there's also anytime we have to, we say that that's because we're responding to this, right? We're responding to somebody who is going like, I don't know if you're listening, so I need you to reassure me mm -hmm. or that feeling in yourself of like, I don't know if I'm listening. I should probably reassure that person that I'm listening. Right. And, um, that's something that, uh, that was, that was what was coming up for me when you said like, how, how does that come up in our daily practice? Like, yeah. I think anytime I say that, I'm like, Oh, there was a gap, there was a gap there. Like that wasn't, that wasn't what I wanted to be doing. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think particularly when, you know, when you live with somebody, like you have a, a couple dozen times a day probably to get it wrong or right, you know, yeah. even in the smallest ways. And, um, and each one of those is a moment where you can like think critically about like, what is it that I want to be doing right now? And like, what is it that I'm accomplishing in, in my actions? Yeah. And for me, what comes up Meg is um, a couple of things. Cause in a way that no, no, I'm listening is it's definitely a reaction and the reaction is i don't want you to think that i'm not caring for you or i'm not demonstrating my love for you yep. the reality is you just caught me not listening <laughs> it's not about being caught but it's it's you're present and i'm not mm -hmm. so the other piece is uh, it's wanting to show care but not doing it effectively in that moment as well as not being present in the moment so it's a little bit of bring it back to the present and when we're present we can more effectively listening and essentially communicate. For sure. Like I, I'll do meditation sometimes. It's just bells just to remind myself to be present, like random bells. Oh. And I love the idea of you saying, or like one saying, no, no, I'm, I'm listening as being like a bell. Like if we can, and I'm going to try to do this, if I can like reframe that as soon as I hear those words coming out of my mouth as a bell of like, Oh, this is listening practice. Now this, I was clearly not listening. And I'm going to um, reframe it like what you were just saying, Nate, of, oh, you know, I wasn't listening and I, I want you to know that I care. Like I was distracted or I was thinking about something else or I was you know, stressed about this other thing and that wasn't what I wanted to be doing. I wanted to be listening and I'm sorry for that and, and now I'm back. Um, yeah. It's an opportunity for daily listening practice or any, uh, any time you say, no, 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 I was listening. I wonder There's how often you could replace no, 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 I was listening with I wish I had been listening more in that moment, like, or I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. Like really, could you always replace that with a truer statement, right? Which is like, I should have been listening more right there, or I wasn't fully present, or you got me, like, <laughs> whatever it is. This is why we do this. I'm just gonna, I'm grabbing a piece of paper to take a note here. <laughs> <laughs> I've got mine. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm curious, can you tell us more about the, the groups that you typically facilitate with now? So like what's uh if there is a normal group for you, like what are what are they like? Like what's the what are the normal demographics? What are the normal like goals that you're trying to facilitate them towards? You've kind of hinted at a few of these things, but I wonder if you can give us like a, a full picture of that. Yeah. Um <laughs> normal is probably the, the word that doesn't describe it. Perfect. Uh, okay. You know, there isn't a typical, um, and I know, I know that I have a lot of growth in this as well, um, but I continue to work with a variety of groups in a variety of settings. Um, I don't know the, the breakdown percentage-wise, and it's shifted over the, the past few years um, in terms of direct service facilitation versus train the trainer, train the teacher, so to speak. Okay. Um, I like to generally keep a healthy balance with that. It doesn't need to be 50-50, but for the past, uh, has it been 12 years, 10, 10 to 12 years, um, it's been a lot of training facilitators, and that's okay. facilitators that are working with youth um, in a camp setting, in a phys ed setting, schools, 
um, therapeutic agencies and otherwise after school programs and so on. It's also been people that work with adults that might be running, um, you know, a basic team building event, a one day event for people to connect, uh, maybe a little more building a team um, to some folks that are doing organizational development work. So Nate, with those groups that you're doing training the trainers of who are working with youth, are you doing the full train the trainer or are you doing a component of that typically or generally speaking? Um, define component in full. Uh, like someone's bringing you in for one module of maybe like a several day long program um, or you're doing the, the full program. So you'll be in touch with that group through the entire training experience that they're having. Yeah. Um, well, I, I certainly look at training as a journey. So uh, it can be a little bit of both though. So for me, a full is like, and maybe, I don't know if you've got the sense that, uh, that I appreciate um, breadth and depth is uh, the long term of it is I think, and I hope that I would convey this in my trainings and demonstrate this in my practice that the training never stops, that we're always learning that we're on that continued path. Specifically like with a set number of days or a set, um, program flow. Uh, it's a little bit of both. Sometimes I'm doing a specific component. I would say more often it could be um, foundational skills of facilitation, working towards a practice, right, and providing feedback and helping a team of people that would be willing to give feedback to one another. Cool. Yeah. The one thing that you, so you mentioned like the groups often vary, um, is the content like, and the, and the con, uh, context in some ways varies, right? Like some of it's direct service and some of it is train the trainer. Is the content, like that would be different um, in those two two settings, but is the like the content of what you're facilitating or the goals that the groups have, do, are those as varied? Or is it like when I'm doing a training, like direct service with folks, we tend to have, you know, like I tend to work around kind of six or seven of these different goals and we might pick three over here, you know what I mean? Um, but is the, is the, are the goals varied or are those also really different and you're just kind of there as the person who can hold that process? Yeah, uh, I, I, I would say that I'm noticing a little bit of a difference between train the trainer, train the facilitator type work, um, although it's kind of baked in, but there is a different skill set to facilitate, right? Yeah. To, to lead a group or guide a group, um, to go through methodologies that, that brings group together and so on. So the, the meta view of that, so to speak, right? The bigger picture view. Um, and right now what I'm seeing, getting pulled in for um, anything around facilitation skills, specifically new games and activities from large groups to small groups, to connection activities, to communication activities, collaboration activities, um, and also through the lens of reflection or debriefing, right? So that would be, um, a little bit of a primary focus on the on the train the trainer side. Direct service work has ranged from a uh, one day team building event, like uh, was fortunate to be pulled into a job um, down in North Carolina where it was a two day team building event, two groups, and uh, they wanted something different um, for this group, hands on, engaged, and there was already a, some vision there. Um, but it turned out that we did a, a large team bow drill um, to start, which is fire by friction and the spindles, these pieces of wood were about four feet high, the climbing rope to spin them. They built their own A-frame walkers, which are these big things. They actually turned out to be 12 foot bamboo poles where people were walking on these things that they constructed. It looked like there were five of these at a time. And it almost looked like a scene out of star Wars. It was amazing. <laughs> they used that same material to build a bridge. And then to use that same material with additional supplies to build a raft and to race a raft and then to see how many people they could fit on a raft. That was amazing. It was one day, you know, two days. Um, and to con oh, go ahead. I was going to say, what were you doing? Well, so they're doing that. Like, what are you doing in, in those moments? Are you, um, yeah, what are you doing in those moments? Yeah, one, I was supporting a good friend um, in terms of shaping that vision. So this is the, the planning stage of it. Okay, the design of that experience? Exactly. Okay. Yep. Meeting with the client, finding what they wanted, and this client was just phenomenal. They had a clear vision. Um, oftentimes, they were very directive of what they wanted, 
Uh, and then as we provided uh, different ideas and sometimes push back, it was either, no, we're not going with that idea or, okay, let's see what works. Cool. Um, so the importance of meeting with a client either, in this case, it was in person, which I think is super valuable. Um, some of it was over the phone as well. But in that design process, um, looking at the logistics of it, looking at uh, how do we inform a facilitation team, which I was also a part of, um, prepping it and then going live with the two days. Um, so I think we had really great partners with the client because they took on the bulk of purchasing the materials and getting the materials on site. Um, we took care of uh, the overall design and guiding that process. Um, but partnering with the client to um, have their voice throughout the day. And then, and then it was, um, some of it was, uh, we literally had some information printed. So in terms of um, team bow drill, we did a de I did a demonstration about a smaller um, personal bow drill. Cool. And the hope was that they would apply that knowledge to the team bow drill. Uh, and oftentimes there was a lot of observation if a group was on track to potentially getting a fire, right? Getting smoke anyway, it was, uh, it was tough. Um, then you let them go. If the group was, you know, if there was disengagement, it was maybe a quick circle up. How's this going for you? Is there anything that you're needing? Cool. Um, and sometimes it was very direct, try this. Other times it was, how is it going? And let them fill in that in, right? Okay. Yeah. And that, was, that would probably be similar all the way through. I would say a lot of this day was observation though, because the group was so, well, let me say this, after the initial greeting of, hey, you know, good morning, how's your day going? Many people's response was, was good, happy to be here. Also a good, at least 25%, not good, don't wanna be here, this is my day off. But by the end, probably even by mid morning, um, most everyone was super engaged. Um, so yeah, sometimes it was, it was kind of cheering for them. Sometime it was reflecting back some things that I heard from them. It was a fun day. Cool. Wow. Nate, one of the things you said earlier was that you, well, I, I might be remembering this improperly, so let me know if I do, uh, sure. is that you like to have a balance between doing train the trainers and doing direct service. Why yep. is that? Oh, yeah. Um, For me, it's if I'm training someone to do something and all I'm doing is training people to do something, I think we can be an effect we can be effective. However, I think we're more effective if we're doing it ourselves and have a relevant story or stories to relate to the the participants of the training with their experience. So what do you mean by effective? Like what's the um, how would you define it? Or like for you, like what is effective in that case? Hmm. Cause I like the reason I ask is so yeah. when we I've talked to other folks, they've often said like, I can be more effective as in I can have a greater impact when I'm doing a train the trainer. Um, and because those people are going to take what I know and be able to disperse it into tons of other people. And so the reason I ask is because you seem to be like, no, like sometimes direct training, I can have a greater effect with that group. Um, yeah. yeah. So here's, here's what I would say to that is I definitely agree that when you, when you look at the um, effectiveness through impact and if you're a train the trainer, so if I work with, um, you know, 25 teachers or 25 corporate trainers, right? Organizational development specialists, whatever. And then they each run their own training of 20 people, 50 people, 100 people. It multiplies, right? So you could say that your training has impacted more and more people, which I agree with. And I, I believe in that being effective. I believe that being impactful. And what I'm talking about being effective is if, if I can say, you know, because it's a mix of hands-on experiences through the trainings that I lead, um, as well as uh, reflection, so sort of wisdom from the moment, and then bringing in particular frameworks or models, concepts, theories, right? So it's a little more cognitive. And for me, if all I'm doing is staying in that realm, that 
I'm, I'm getting a, a part of the message across, but what really highlights this and what I think is some of the most human aspects of the work that we do is when we have a story. And that can be the stories that are being created in front of us. But if I say, okay, so here's this activity or here's this theory, and we just do that in the training so that the people get it in the way that I train and others train um, is to invite people in as participants, right? And to reflect as professionals. They'll reflect as participants as well. But then we step back and say, okay, from, from this, as you're leading this, what would be going on? So that participant professional or um, participant practitioner hat, so to speak. And if I can illustrate what's happening with a story. So like if I ran, you know, I just recently ran this particular activity or I ran, uh, you know, facilitated a particular meeting in this way. And this was the result of that tool or this is how the group interacted which shows them more the humanness of that interaction. Because what we do in a training group, oftentimes in a training group, not all the time, but oftentimes you get people that wanna be there. They wanna learn the methodology, they wanna learn the content, they wanna connect with people in the room. Not always the case, right? Depending on different settings and situations, but often people want to be there. Well, what if they don't? Or what if, what if um, their group has one experience and you can highlight another story that says, wow, we didn't have that. You know, there's, there's stories that say, this was our experience and I wanna share something that was really powerful that I didn't know was gonna happen. You know, and here's, here's the same activity, same guidelines. Here's where either an individual in the group took it or here's where the group took it. So illustrating what that story makes it human. Yeah, and Nate, if I'm, if I'm hearing you, like it's not about effectiveness or, effectiveness and, and reach would be kind of like the words I would use. So like train the trainers, you might have more reach, but you could still be really ineffective, right? You could you could ineffectively reach all of those corporate trainers and they could go out and do bad trainings as a result of you. So you're reaching lots of people, but they're not prepared to do that in, a, in an effective way or in a, in a way that it has like a powerful, um, or creates powerful experience. But by you doing, or by spending more time doing direct trainings in addition to train the trainers, hopefully, um, through those stories, through those experiences, through seeing activities run in different ways, you can prepare them better for those eventualities. So then when the reach happens, they're effective. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Could, yep. I would, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's speaking to different ways that people take in and process information. For sure. And, and I think there's legitimacy, and I'm not saying that any trainer that doesn't do direct service work or, you know, if you're not doing the work, it's it's not, I don't want to create a contradiction here. For me personally, it just feels good. And this is something, you know, I would talk with a good friend of mine, Ryan McCormick, who's a trainer at High Five. There was this importance for us when both of us worked at Project Adventure that we had some connection to the direct work that we were training people to do. And then yeah. we could say either last week or a few months ago, here's an experience that, um, that we could we could have that our own experience with what we're training to like when we go to implement a plan it's like i thought this was going to go well and it didn't or you know i had intentions here and it went great it was right on yeah yeah i think that um it's it we can project as much as we like we can only project so far i think is how i would say it like at, when you're writing a, a a facilitation or a curriculum or you're doing a train the trainer, right? You are one step removed from that direct participant experience, or one more step removed than that facilitator is, right? And what what I would try, what I try to do when I'm doing a train the trainer, right, is like project into their experience and like give them the tools they'll need to navigate it. But it's still a projection, like it's not just like it's not a lived experience, and um, and knowing that is a like a barrier to. Um, to really understanding, like I think is important. So I, I'm with you that it's it's a tough balance, but it's also the acknowledgement of the limitation, I think is 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 key to navigating the limitation. Yeah, and maybe Meg, if I could speak to that, because when you're saying that, I think what can come up too is that sometimes the perception of training can feel like, well, it's a three-day training around this subject, right? Around this topic, around how to facilitate this group in this particular whatever and I'll go back to that learning doing being concept that 
training, and maybe, maybe this is simply what training is, it's, it's taking in information, it's learning something cognitively. And oftentimes, at least in my experience, up until the past few years, training meant, okay, you've been trained, now go do it. We have no clue what they're doing. We no clue, have no clue whether they're being effective or not. Um, and I think that comes back to when we get into a client assessment or understanding the bigger picture of the training and working with a client that says, we want to bring you in for something. And if we can lay out, well, what, what exactly are the results that you're going for? Because um, if we can move from simply training, you come in and do your thing for a few days and you say, okay, you've been trained in this and then they're on their own. They don't have your guidance or you haven't developed their guidance potentially to know whether they're on the right track or not or incrementally become more effective. The flip side of that is this uh, a, a space that I'm so grateful to be working in um, and as you know that the idea of drifting a little bit is a place that I hadn't intend to be, didn't know I would be um, and didn't even know that I would love it and I'm loving it and it's 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 couched in that bigger picture of organizational development work. Um, so it's, it's beyond team building. I can, I can reference, I watched Michelle Cummings uh, facilitating <laughs> XYZ. There was a nice moment of team bonding, team building, and team development. And I'm involved in that work, and that's shorter term. And I think Michelle highlighted this. And even team development, there, that's more involved certainly than team bonding, connecting people, team building, developing a team or building a team, right? Bringing them together. Um, the de team development is some work, but when you start moving into organizational work, uh, I've been fortunate to be contracted for um, a longer term culture shift uh, position and involved in one right now. So it's, these are multi-year projects, working with multiple levels of the organization um, and both of them, both of the projects that I'm involved or the initiatives that I'm involved in incorporate this aspect of learning, doing, being where the people that we are facilitating and working with are eventually becoming the facilitators of their colleagues, their coworkers. And to watch them do the work where, you know, moving from understanding how to do it, knowing how to do it, and then doing it, giving themselves feedback, giving each other feedback, myself and a colleague, Bart Crawford, that I'm working with to give that feedback. It, for me, it lights me up because that's, that's more of the work that I want to do. I think that's really when we become even more and more effective. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually where people can be on their own and they're on their own development path. Um, but that's a preference of where I want to be now. And not only within organizational development work around culture shifts, but also with facilitators. And I think your resource facilitating XYZ is an example of this, is that it's great to be in person, it's great to do a training, and it's great to be right there with them on sort of the coaching phase of that, where they are actually doing it, and you're providing some feedback or real-time coaching. But something like facilitating XYZ allows for a reference all the way through. I go online, I can get a snippet, a nugget of an idea of something that I just did so I can reflect or I can learn more and then implement. Um, but longer term contact with, with groups in any setting, whether it's camp counselors delivering, you know, great group games through the summer, teachers, phys ed teachers or teachers in a, in a school, um, people that are working with businesses, therapeutic agents, that, that idea of longer term contact with them and coaching them to be more effective, uh, again, it just lights me up. And I think it's, if I were to set an ideal, it's how this work should be done. And I'm not big on shoulds. <laughs> All right. But I would say, you know, for folks that want to go there, let's go there. Yeah. It's, you, and you mentioned, so the multiple year long program um, versus like you, you kind of hit it this earlier, like a three day program. You, you even talked about in that like shorter program, how a component of that is helping them build the capacity to continue growing in their facilitation. And am I, did I hear that right? But that's something yeah. you often go to even in the smaller groups. So is, I'm curious, like what, what does that look like? So is that near the end of those trainings, I assume, or, or, and, and are, are you doing that with activities? Are you doing that? Are you just giving them frameworks that they then um, like 
live into after you leave? Like, what does that look like? That idea of helping people build capacity to build their own capacity at the end of a training that you're doing. Yeah. Um, I think with that, you know, and you can do it in shorter time frames, right? Yeah. yeah what does it look like in a shorter time frame? Short, yeah. So here's an experience. I work for Project Adventure, which is a nonprofit um, just north of Boston um, around adventure education, challenge courses, and so on, um, facilitating a group games methodology. And the majority of my time there, I was a trainer. Um, and oftentimes it was around foundational skills. A lot of times that people hadn't had any experience with adventure education, experiential ed, the term facilitation, right? What is that? We're still trying to figure out what that is. That's why this is also a great project. <laughs> we learn so much. Um, and when I first started, I think what was modeled to me, especially on that foundational level, was jam-pack the days with activities. You know, you're trying to grab 30 to 40, 50, sometimes 60 activities in a day. Multiply that by, you're right, many days. It's like I looked at some of my old train reports, and I don't even know how I got through what I did. And I think this, and I've looked at other trainers, I'm like, how? And you just, you're cranking. Yeah. And even there's reflection in that, right? And then you learn to slow down. I remember, again, I'll reference Bart Crawford. At one point, he, he realized he worked at Project Adventure for years as well, has his own company now, Crawford Collaborative Consulting. And he, he looked at me one day and said, less is more. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and he just said, you know, I used to try to jam pack these days and, if you really take the time with it, it's great. So less is more. You don't need to do all these activities. And, and what less is more allows for are more questions, right? So it's really about their understanding. Um, but, but really your questions seem around setting up uh, for people to be internally supporting each other. Yeah. Um, I worked with a camp out in, in Pennsylvania um, for the past five or six years now. And we do foundational facilitation skills, foundational technical skills for a challenge course. Um, and they were a group of sharp facilitators. They, they rock and they get it and they get the depth of, of, the, of the potential of this work. Towards the end of the training, which it's been four or five day training, the end is having them lead activities. So when it's the practice of their own delivery, their own activity selection, so now they're doing what they just experienced and what they saw me do or model. However, what I'm baking in there is they're not only doing that, but they're going to give themselves feedback. And it's really basic. It's give yourself one positive, one constructive. Okay. The whole group, not every single person, but if anyone's really has something to share, they'll give a positive or constructive. That's written down, handed back to the facilitator so they can reflect on it over time. Um, and the hope would be that they take that tool, that skill, and bring that through the summer, especially when they're co-facilitating or they typically have one person that's, um, you know, titled challenge course coordinator, but they're often not with a group. They're floating around so they can hop into a group, give a quick observation. Um, so it's instilling the action of observation and feedback. Yeah, so you have them practice not just the running the activity, but practice giving and receiving feedback in the train the trainer. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that's a great idea. And I, you know, it's it's funny uh, when Megan and I train the trainers. People are we we have this two hour curriculum, and people are always like, "Well, if we want to do it for three hours, like, what would you think we would add?" And we're like, "Nothing. Like, in fact, take one of the activities away. Like, just do the same exact curriculum for three hours." because we don't need more activities. You just need more time for each activity. Like we could do that two hour curriculum for five hours and it could be a really amazing experience. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's funny how obvious that is in hindsight, but how like obvious the flip is to people when they have it, like it's, it's so obvious to people like more activities, more time, of course. Like if I have five hours, I'm gonna do 50 activities. If I, uh -huh. if I have 10, I'm gonna do 100 activities, right? Um, but in hindsight, I'm like, why did I ever do that? Yeah. And it, it maybe with that too is thinking about, and I don't know for you and Meg, you say two hours, but have you thought about even with that two hours, all the pieces that you could essentially um, kind of break break down, right? Kind of pick apart from um, what it is that you're delivering and say either here's what we're doing or here's what they're doing that's a skill to literally be developed and practiced. And, yeah. and some of it might be flat out um, 
how do you set up a room? How do you, how do you, how do you language what you want to say? How do you want to frame a particular activity or the purpose of being there? Um, you know, big picture with this, an effective tool is uh, using Simon Sinek's golden circle of why, how, what, which many people have seen this, um, but it resonates. When I look at activities or, you know, whether that's a, a game that you play or a flip chart activity, that's so much of the what. And the what is where we interact, where we interact with that, the moment in a, in, a, in a tool or a game or something that's helping facilitate the interaction. Simon Sinek was, is so big on the why, which I agree with. We have to be clear about our intentions, why we're doing things. And sometimes in the trainings, we're actually missing the how, right? So how are Meg and Sam doing what they're doing? And I know you're unpacking that for us through your books, through your online resources, through interviewing folks like myself and others. And, it's hot, and there's a lot within the how. So I don't know, maybe the loaded, loaded question for you, but have you ever thought about the, the nuggets that you can break down? And if I were to ask you in a simple word of how do you do what you do, what would you say? I think... Um... I think I was I was thinking about like which direction we approach trying to share people the information that we do because I think that for facilitating XYZ for our train the trainers like we are really trying to get into the the how as like in service of the why like you know like this activity ideally will allow people to do this thing right and like that's the deeper meaning of like that activity but like how you do it is going to impact whether that why happens or not. So, and, and I think that like for facilitation, as you said, like it's this abstract concept that a lot of us have hard time defining. And I think so often people are like, you know good facilitation when you see it, right? Or you like some people get it and some people don't. And like, while I believe there are some people who have like a way of just walking into a room where you're just like drawn to that person or all of a sudden they can change the energy of a space. Like there are also really detailed technical ways that you can teach somebody how to do something better, right? Like don't like only let three people share in this activity would be like a really technical how that me and Sam do. And it serves the, like your, your why will not get any deeper you will not get it any better if you let six people share, right? So just let three. And I think like in, we're always kind of chasing like, what are the hows that can serve those deeper meaning whys? Um, I don't know, that was like what came up for me uh, immediately when you said that. You know, Nate, I don't know if you've ever had this pushback, but something that I've experienced a lot is people are so attached to the what that they think that the game or the activity is what matters most. And, and if they're like, so they're like, okay, so we've got to do this game. Like, so maybe you do a particular like um, initial icebreaker or whatever it might be, or you do you use a particular um, uh, activity to accomplish a certain, like to get to friction or to get to communication or to get to listening. And they're like, oh, so that's, that's the how that you use that what to get to that how every time and it's like, no, the what is the easiest thing to change? Like, I, I often think like uh, in our trains, we're like, just do none of these activities. Like we really don't care. Like plug in whatever you want in these settings. And if your how is connected to the same why, like if the why is to get people to challenge their own bias, or if the, the why is to get people to um, see the ways that they take up space or see the ways that like society informs how they take up space or whatever it might be, like those are often our whys. Um, we're here to, um, to in some way like challenge um, institutional or internalized oppression. So like, the how is connect you got to connect that why to the what but the what is like we could throw 15 different what's in there to get to that same why but it's funny because people really do think that oh so you gotta do that particular no you don't like you don't have to do that particular activity or that particular game there are that's the easiest thing to to replace absolutely i yeah i agree and we can sometimes it's it's our place with this work too in a way of um, how do I say it? We can be so enthralled by the the activities themselves, or you know, we can see the magic there and lose sight what an act, what a facilitator is actually doing. Yeah, right. And it's like, well, the game just did that. 
yeah. you know, and uh, and that might be a place to start. It's tangible. It's concrete. Exactly. It's it's the activity, and we start to expand further. Well, well, how do I do that? How do I lead the activity and so on? There's also a piece around, um, yeah, get into that bigger picture. But I love your your connection with the how, right? Um, uh, I'm missing your words, Meg, when you when you talked about how the I think it was the how serves the why. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I think about uh, another great friend and mentor, Pam McPhee, who's the founder and director of the Brown Center um, at the University of New Hampshire, and uh, I can recall oftentimes with her working with groups this saying of what we do is important and how we do what we do is important is you know is um is also important so look let's look at how we do that and that's simply how groups of people are working with each other how we facilitate people and it's not negating the why i think pam's pretty clear with the significance of why and i align with that as well but it's reminding people and i almost i almost wonder um we're we're all uh excited about why right now and i think simon sinek uh, this comedian Michael Jr. So if you look up Michael Jr. Why, you'll see a nice piece of him inviting someone to sing "Amazing Grace" in two different ways. And, okay. Uh, yeah, that'll be a nice link to throw to people. But why is certainly powerful, uh, and uh, I think some of this work that I'm doing, maybe that we're doing, is well, that's all good. How do I do that? Yeah. And the how is so significant, right? How do I create an, an inclusive environment? How do I, you talked about um, institutional oppression. Well, how do I address that, right? I mean, it just goes on, it's just, it's so massive. What do I do with it, right? Exactly. To, yeah. how do I engage people in a, in a fun learning process? Oof. I've been I've been thinking lately, you know, a lot of people want like solutions, right? Like they're, they, they, they want to jump to like, okay, well like, the can you just tell me the, the solution to to institutionalize racism right like that like we this is all nice but we want to just jump to the solution and something i've been thinking and realizing is like we know the solution to a lot of things right like like when your team isn't working right the solution is like to connect with your like the solution is or the end goal is to just like connect with your team right have authentic meaningful conversations yeah. <laughs> just do that right yeah. Yeah. Have authentic, meaningful conversations, full of vulnerability and willingness to fail and willingness to be criticized, and just that's that's the solution, right? And that because the solution isn't the problem, right? Like that's not the it's all the things that get in the way of us getting to that solution. That's where the work is, right? Like how do we solve institutionalized racism? Treat everybody with the same amount of dignity and respect, regardless of race. Yay, we figured it out, right? Um, Next. But, Next. Oh, this is good. Let's work it. <laughs> yeah, but it's that how. Like, how do we do that? And, like, what gets in the way of that um, is so much of what our work is. Um, one, well, oh, course. Oh, I was going to say, in, in the three of us, clear, clearly, in some way, we see the how as facilitation, right? Like, that's why we're here. That's why we're having this conversation. And I'm curious, so like Nate, with, with your work doing Train the Trainers and like your appreciation of our work that focuses on that how, are there particular things that you've noticed, like when it comes to using facilitation as a tool or giving people that just this like world as a how, um, are there particular things that you've noticed with the groups you've been working with as like, oh wow, when they noticed that, they had this, they, they had this how that would open up all of these other doors. And it was just a small thing and it's something that you now find yourself like wanting to give to groups or give to participants as often as you can. Yeah, what's coming up for me, and it relates to Meg's remark a little earlier or just before this as well, is that we can look at the example institutional race, racism and say we know the solution. It's authentic conversations, authentic connections, being vulnerable, right, and so on. And I had a reaction to when you said, oh, we know what it is. Because I agree, like, I think we know and I think anyone in the world knows what would work for them. And I think one of the keys, what I'm going to bring it to is, so I, I agree with what, Meg, what you're saying and what your remarks are, is that when people have relationships with each other, when people feel connected to each other, when people know one another, they're going to treat, um, when people know each other, they're going to treat people differently. 
right? It's like if you know someone, and most of the time that's a good thing, right? Is if I know someone, I'm more likely to help them. I'm more likely to do something with them, right? I'm going to go to engage in, in with someone that I know differently um, because of that familiarity. And I laugh at this because sometimes it's like you can be in a setting and maybe either of you have had this experience or others uh, that are viewing this, that moment where it's like you're in the space, say there's 50 people and 100 people, and the person that you kind of know, you don't really have a relationship with, but you are best friends. You are so tight with them. It's like, oh, so glad you're here. It's like, I just needed a place to be a little more comfortable and you're familiar, so let's do it, <laughs> right? Um, so, so there's this piece of being connected and, and treating people differently that we know. Back to the knowing pieces, we know those, the value of those authentic relationships and connections. I think the other side, Sam, your question is, as we're facilitating and what's that thing that I'm practicing that I would encourage in the train the trainer yeah. is that we don't know. Nice. And it, it's sort of, um, and I don't want to say that so definitively. We can make predictions. We can think about, um, but if we hold the space of not knowing truly what's going to result because every person in every interaction can be so different, uh, and it's more about them than it is us, it, you know, at least my perspective in that moment is I can know what I think is going to be helpful for a situation but I don't know what's going to be helpful to the people that are in front of me to help them understand what they need to understand and to, to get like, it's, it's that idea of meeting them where they're at. Like my knowing may be so far away my solution, it might be effective, but it might be so far away of where this group's at. So come on in just get together and connect. It's like, Oh no, we're not there. Right. We're not ready for that. So, I would I would put it in that space of uh, of not knowing and working with a group that it's that saying the more you know, um, or the more more the, the more you learn the less you know. I think yeah. some Beatles, the music yeah. group, had stated that. Others, it's that place of yeah, you can learn so much about working with groups. And I just find that as I continue to learn in this, it's about holding that space for not knowing, uh, the curiosity and inviting people to be observers and asking people, how is that for you? What's going to work for you? And so how do you, so it's like the, so, so, the so, Socrates quote, right? Like the only true knowing is a knowing you know nothing. How do you, now that you know that, like you feel like that's the one thing you know, or, or you know, I'm, I'm speaking for you, but so you know that, and you know that's important for facilitation to some degree, and I would totally agree with you, and that's something that I'm often trying to help groups get. How do you do that? So like, what's your how for that? How do you help a participant, maybe an individual potential facilitator or a group of potential facilitators um, get closer to that? Yeah, yeah. I would say it's um, observing and asking questions. Uh, that's, that's um, and sometimes those are questions out to the whole group. Maybe it's a one-on-one, -on -one, like, hey, what are you noticing or what's needed in this moment? Um, yeah. That would be the most direct, tangible piece. Yeah, what types of questions are you asking to get at this particular, um, like hopefully to get this particular outcome for people? Uh, this is this is a practice for me because I, I think part of the not knowing and holding that space for not having an answer for certain things and, and especially allowing the group to define which allows you to meet them, right, as a facilitator. Okay, if they're here, then maybe we would do this next. Okay. Um, or this might be helpful or even asking them, what would be helpful in this moment? Um, but I'm, I would go back to a conversation uh, just, when was it, Monday night, with uh, Pam McPhee and Bart Crawford. Happened to be with both of them. And I was joking that we should, um, we should bug Pam's house because there are conversations that happen there uh, around group work and facilitation that are brilliant. And if you haven't uh, invited Pam onto your show, I highly rec recommend Pam. And... Uh, She's aware, she's excited, and she looks forward to hearing from you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if you're so inclined. Um, yeah. yeah. But Pam is phenomenal. Uh, and uh, I won't go into the details because I'm still understanding it for myself, but the basics are rather than being so definitive 
with a question like, what is the way that we're going to do something? Changes into how might you do that, right? So I think the term was conditionals and plurals, and that's the thing that I'm still working out myself. So it's how might we do that versus how are we going to do that? How are we going to it implies one way or the way. How might we implies that there's many ways. So then the next layer of the plurals piece is uh, what are some of the possible ways? So we're really inviting possibility, right? Versus saying what are all the ways that we could, even all the ways that's like, whoa, right? Right? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's trying to, to layer out some possibilities, which then allows for some choice. That's awesome. That makes a lot of sense too. Um, that word might has come up a couple of times in our conversations with folks and just, I think, like uh, you, you kind of offhandedly mentioned, like I'm not big on shoulds. And uh, <laughs> I feel like that's, you know, I, I resonate a lot with that. And I think that word might is um, this kind of flip side possibility of like, there's so much um, that opens up when you have that word in there. And even if you just replace one word um, in your questions, just the, the power of that, I think is really, really intense. Um, so one thing that you said that has come up a couple other times with folks recently is the this is more about them than about us, or there's more than them about me. And it seems like something that like all of us as facilitators need to be constantly reminded of. And I'm wondering what are the ways in which you either like remind yourself of that, or if that doesn't spring anything to mind, like what are the things you think get in the way of you being able to hold that truth or like be in that truth? Hmm. Yeah. Hey, one quick technical thing that I'm just noticing, uh, and I'm fine with this either way. And I don't know what your screen's doing, but I'm noticing when I speak, um, my, I'm not coming up to the full screen as, as this function works. So I don't know if that's a concern. I'm fine to keep going. No, it is a concern. So sometimes the, and that's really helpful for you to point out because sometimes, so Meg is like in the control room right now. Um, sometimes we'll accidentally hit a setting or whatever, and it'll just be one person's face the whole time. Good catch. <laughs> Meg, I don't know, do you have something clicked or do you think it's okay? I think it's okay. So I think that there is construction happening outside of my window, which is right here. And I think basically I have to mute myself or I'm going to stay big screen. But when I've been doing that, Nate, you've been popping up as normal. So okay. it, it should be OK. But I, I think that I have to be muted in order for the functionality to continue. The other thing, Nate, I don't know if you've got, if you click on a person's face in the bottom, I'm looking at this right now, it'll have a white box around it. So that'll change what you're seeing, but it won't necessarily change what other people are seeing. So you might have one person in focus. OK. OK. Yeah. Cool. That's good to know. Yeah, and, so uh, like, I just want to look at myself the whole time, or I just want to look at Meg being <laughs> silent the whole time. You, can, it's totally up to you. You can right. at your camera um, in whatever way is makes sense for you. Yeah, and it's like here, here's two things that are coming up right now, and then we'll get back to your question, Meg. Is uh, and it relates. Is one, it's this is the practice of um, noticing something and saying something, seeing something, say it right. Uh, which if you've traveled in airports, you hear that a lot about keeping it safe. But I think it just applies in general. Is that I'm seeing this. I want to make sure it's okay for you, for other people viewing, whatever. The, the other part that is humorous to me is in this moment that we're saying that it's not about me or us, it's about them. I'm like, hey, I'm not on your screen. <laughs> My face isn't big on your screen. Like, can people see me? <laughs> but it isn't <laughs> Because we have had a whole interview where it was just Sam's face uh, the whole time. And the other people, when they would talk, would just stay little. And you would just have Sam's like vivid reaction to it. So I promise it's not a selfish. It is, it is a selfless ask because yes. otherwise it would be unusable video. So right. that's fair. where, you know, I'm sure, Sam, that, that moment, that video, you have some great responses showing that you're listening, setting up for the next question. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that's the piece that, you know, some could be, people could even view this moment and be like, whoa, he needs his big face on the screen. Like, what's that about? Really, the intent is making sure that we're getting the quality that you're looking for in this program um, in that way, and that it's a shared space, right? That's a, that's a nice thing about this. Um, 
the question though, coming back to it was around the, the it's not about me, it's about them. What do I do? Um, Cause you actually, I don't know if either one of you reframe that, but or yeah, have it. I can, I can ask it again. So I think that um, the, it's about them. It's not about me. Is something that a lot of us like know, but struggle to do um, or struggle to like be in. So my question is like, what do you do that helps you cultivate and hold that truth? Like it, be present in that and what gets in the, and like, if that doesn't strike you, like what gets in the way of you being able to really hold that? Like it's about them. Great. Yeah. Um, one is acknowledging that perhaps um, we go through certain phases of this and it's not, it's not a um, progression where you end at one place. You could go back to another, you know, another spot given the situation. So one is for me, it's um, kind of a, a conceptual framework that, uh, that I can track in my own experience with this work um, that I might see in others and acknowledge, and I'm not telling anyone that they're wrong if they're doing some of this for them. And uh, part of it, the, the progression that I see anyway, and I'm, I'm still kind of working this out, is that we do this work initially for ourselves, right? And I'll speak for myself. The moment that I realized, and going back to my story with uh, the great friend and mentor, Tony Calcia, inviting me to be a camp counselor for the rec department was huge. And it wasn't about the conversation we had. It was the fact that, so wait, you're telling me that I can spend my summer playing with kids, having a social network instantly because of the friends of other camp counselors. I can play wiffle ball and I can give piggybacks. I can be outside all day. This is awesome. And in that moment, I, f I felt so alive, much different than what I was feeling at other aspects or other times that in that my life. Like I wasn't feeling so connected, or integrated in that moment. So I got into this work uh, certainly because I enjoyed it. You know, if people had said, well, why did you want to be a camp counselor? Classic question. I love working with kids, right? I love watching them light up. Well, isn't that about me, right? Yeah. And quickly realized that, whoa, and this is part of because of Tony's guidance and us as a staff, again, we're empowered that we realize, wow, we, we are going to be influential. We can impact the, these kids, these lives that we're working with. So it is about them. It's about each other. And it's about the community here. Community was very strong in North Attleboro in that regard. So going from there, you shift from it's about you, you know, I mean, I, I worked in wilderness therapy for four years. I had never backpacked before. Part of it was going into wilderness therapy um, as a guide to learn how to backpack, to learn how to rock climb and ice climb, to learn how to canoe with, uh, you know, without taking an outward bound course or a nose course or other. And it wasn't avoiding that. It's just how do I manage my, my resources, my finances? So flat out, and that wasn't the leading thing, but it was like, hey, if I do this work, I'm going to develop these skills. I felt like I was exchanging the ability to work with people, to be a, a facilitator, to you know, develop others at that time um, in a way that was valuable. Um, but I can note this kind of all the way through that there's a part of me that's in what we're doing. Certainly about them is, is key, is that we're working with people. And hopefully you realize uh, that that uh that it's about them it's the next layer so it's about you all the experiences you get to have the places you go the being outside whatever it is the work that you're doing it's about them because we realize we're working and serving other people so in one word it's about service to others so service is the one word but then i like to take it a step further and think well it's about the outcomes it's what we're trying to get to in that experience and then I have a fourth layer with this concept that um, that outcomes are important, and it's really about the co-created moments, the moments that exist. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the this interview, that it's the moments that you can't plan for. It's the moment that you have to be on your feet, um, working with the group and connecting with them, 
which is also about them, but it's, it's also what comes through in that moment. So four layers, it's about yourself, it's about them, it's about the outcomes, it's about what comes through in that moment. And my desire is to spend a lot of time in that last phase of we are co-creating this moment and here comes something that no one knows about and we're gonna work with. So then those tools are, what do you do with that is, um, it's the ability to ask questions and the ability to um, check in. You know, this is something that Bar Crawford and I are very big on is the ability to check in with the group. You know, simply how's this going for you to what's landing, what's not. Um, yeah, I'll, I don't know. I'll leave a little room because yeah. I've been rambling for a bit, but oh, no what questions come up? Yeah, that was great. Yeah, what questions do you have? Are you checking in with the group? <laughs> <laughs> yep, the I am. I have facilitated interview so far. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, they, I, uh, I think that's wonderful. I, my, I was kind of hoping you would say this because Meg, it, I've been thinking this too. Like uh, so many people have mentioned that, and I'm like, it is about you, and it's about them. But I love that you took it even further than that. It's about the outcomes, and more about, or your your hope is to get into those spaces where it's like these things we couldn't have created without those outcomes, without the group, and without the facilitator. Oh, it's it's. I mean, that's it's really wonderful. So I appreciate yeah. you doing that. Um, let me let me say uh, it just to say it. Yeah, I think I think this is one of those concepts. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And how, you know, I would appreciate feedback, feedback on how I do this or anyone else does it, but the simple line of, um, keep your ego in check, right? Check your ego at the door, uh, that, you know, I, I think that for me personally, I think that's something I do. Um, and, I can also feel that creep sometime like, ooh, this attention feels good, right? And it's a balance to that because if you're putting the effort in uh, and, you, in, and you're being noted for something, right? So whether for me, writing a book or just the flat out to be effective and engaging people in an experience or a training, it's, it feels good to be acknowledged for that. But to check it, to understand that uh, this is a concept for me. It, here's, here's, here's a tool that I would do to check my ego is that I believe that every, everything I do and I'll keep it to me and other people might relate is it's me in that moment as we define me like Nate Folan. However, uh, in some funny way, maybe technology would provide this or not that I know that I am a compilation or a uh, uh, conglomerate of all the experiences on all the people in my lives, right? So when I'm doing things, it's it's me because I've integrated all those moments of interactions with other people and other people specifically in what I'm doing. And my hope is that through this, you're you're hearing that I've had a lot of mentors in my life. Yeah. Um, and that ranges from family to friends, colleagues, all, all that's mashed up sometimes. Um, but I know I'm a, my, I am myself when I'm working with a group. And I know it's not just me. Yeah. It's so much of this has to do with uh, the community, the support, the people that I've learned from. And very literally, I was working with a, another good friend, Andrew Seams, one time. And... Uh, this was delivering a training for Project Adventure. He looked over at me, he goes, and he had just recently worked with Bart Crawford, and he said, and he had worked with me before, he goes, hey, I just noticed something. He said, what you just did there was a lot like Bart. And I said, yep. <laughs> and he said, what do you, I said, what did you notice? And it was kind of this pause that Bart has when he works with groups. And he's like, but I've seen you do that before. I said, yeah. He's like, so is that you or Bart? I said, well, it's me but it's my Bart. <laughs> it's like, this was the thing that working with Bart that I saw so effective and that, you know, I made it my own, so to speak, rework it. So I feel good with it. It's not me pretending to be Bart, but to, to pause with a, so right. Just, and we were joking about that. I said, Oh, if you want me to start naming everyone that I'm being, you know, it's not, and, and this is not like, I'm not in the doing phase with a lot of this. Some of it is I'll practice, but, there are definitely those moments that it's like, oh yeah, I'm I'm taking in uh, this this other person's approach, certainly reworking it so it is authentic coming from me. Yeah. Um, but I learned so anyway. A lot of people make us up, don't we? 
<laughs> For sure. I think that's such a good. So I, I think that that's the that's what we're trying to say with that. Like, it's not about me. I think we're trying to say is we don't let our ego run the room, or we don't do this just just to feed our ego, or um, or we don't do this at all to feed our ego. Like, that's I think what what a lot of us are trying to communicate. Um, and I think specifically naming that is more helpful because I yeah. think when we say it's not about us, it's about them. Um, it turns into this like martyrdom feeling that could be really unhealthy for people. And it could create this norm where if you feel any sort of joy from from facilitation that you're doing something wrong, like, that's not what we want either, right? Like um, I think so often I'm, I'm interacting with, with um, adults who are working with youth and they're like, God, are they just doing this for attention? I'm like, is attention a bad thing? Are we framing, are you wanting to create a world where a kid wanting attention from you is a bad thing? Like, let's unpack that. Because yeah. like, wanting attention is a very human thing. And the idea of you like communicating that a kid wanting attention isn't reason enough to give them attention, I think is a really odd like paradigm we're creating. And unfortunately with, with facilitators, um, there is kind of this, I know I, I find myself having to push back against it, like this feeling of guilt if we notice it it, it being something that like maybe we had a better experience than the group did and we're like oh no like that's not how it's supposed to be like well sometimes that is how it is um we can work through that we can work through that specifically about ego um in in ways that i think are really helpful yeah so with you sam and that's that's why i love this concept sorry meg um in, in brief it's what this is about i mean it's kind of an interesting thing to be talking about when i'm the guest speaker here right and you have other guest speakers it's about that guest speaker and i can't i'm finding myself trying to honor that process and answer the questions but i'm like oh sam what do you think and meg what do you think like what's your take on this and that's why i love your setup it's very conversational um and that we just heard from you sam huge and that's it's one of those pieces that how can you get and this is something literally i was just working with on tuesday with a group um part of that organizational development the culture shift piece is helping essentially managers and supervisors learn to talk less so that they can hear from their coworkers who the hope is that they're talking more, yeah. right? So it's more, it is about them. Like we wanna hear from them. And if you keep talking and I'll be quiet right now, so you can ask a question or hear your perspective, Meg, is we hear from them if we leave a space. So I was, um one thing I was I was interested in, and you mentioned it earlier, right, is debriefing. And I was like, oh, like, I wonder if there, and then I was like, wait, debriefing is a perfect, like, connection to this, right? Because something that I know I struggle with as a facilitator is not getting so excited that I, like, give them my answer to whatever, right? Like, what just happened there? right, is something that we often ask in debriefs or especially in experiential work, right, like what just happened there? I have five answers to that, right? <laughs> and I have to stop talking because if I say them, they're gonna think that's what happened. Like they won't in, in turn take the ownership of like, oh, what just happened there is these 15 things, right? And they might have noticed or created something that like I couldn't have done. And that's the beauty of facilitation, right? That's the like the power of facilitation is like that I could only bring my perspective and the rest of the group is bringing theirs. And to me, like, and I, I do want to get into debriefing in a moment, but to me, like, that's also how that the, this is about them, not about me, is that if you center yourself too much, you will literally prevent them from sharing information. Like you will get in the way of the process you are trying to facilitate. Um, and like one of the ways we ideally, I think step back and just act as conduits is like, is debriefing. Um, and I, I have heard from others that you are like particularly skilled in debriefing, which you don't have to agree with or not. I would just love to know, like, I would love to know like, for you, you know, you've been doing this work for a while. What, how has your relationship with debriefing changed over time? Uh, like, we all have to do debriefs when we do activities, right? That's like a, to me, that's a key part. 
but like how do you approach debriefing and then like how has that maybe changed for you over time i don't know if sam wants to add something yeah, like, uh, just kind of uh this will make it more a more challenging question but i don't know if you're you're up for it so you can take this really great Nate. but if you could highlight like one or two things like really like for you that in that change that you were like oh this is a milestone like when i noticed this or started doing this differently i noticed that my ability to debrief just like it moved on a plateau level instead of an incre incremental level. If those are the moments, those are the ones I'd really love to hear about. OK. All right, we'll go with a simple question first. So the more basic question, Meg, thank you. Whew, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, and I love it. It's that nice layering, adding with each other. Um, so what, what came up first, Meg, was, OK, let's go way back. Uh, what I knew was debriefing before I don't even knew that it existed. But essentially, my debriefs um, back in the day, and this is probably, uh, I guess, m mostly when I was doing the wilderness therapy work, uh, a little before that, um, which is, what, 14, 15 years ago or something. Um, is it? Yeah, a little longer than that. Um, but I just remember running... Um, group activities, problem solving initiative, um, things that were, you know, that have been called like trust based activities or trust activities, which I would uh, rework to say maybe it's more about it's a responsibility activity or empathy activity. I don't know. We'll don't go there right now. But um, <laughs> yes, they develop trust and there's developing a lot of other things that make up trust. Uh, but back in the day, I would have like debriefing for me was you'd play a game, even a tag game or a group initiative, and you say, I would ask um, immediately, so how does that relate to life? <laughs> yeah. That was like my tool, my question. Like, you know, there's so many, so many great tools and questions for debriefing now, right? And my, it would be like this one, one index card that says, how does that connect to life? I think that's telling for me is that I do this work because I'm curious about how it connects and what the what the implications are, um, how to integrate it into our everyday lives, uh, including that moment. Um, I don't see it as separate, but it, yeah. So, and then the change, and we'll bring in Sam incrementally, um, was uh, further work with the wilderness therapy piece for sure was learning um, yeah, debriefing, but processing, right? So I kind of look at that debriefing as a traditional end of an experience, which we would do, uh, after we got off an expedition, a trip, a four day trip or week long trip. Um, I worked in Utah as well as Maine and the, the program in Utah, the kids were out for 90 days the whole, the whole time the, the staff shifted, you know, week on a week off the students up in Maine were, um, shorter term, six to 10 weeks, um, and four day trips, you know, so they, they'd have a base camp essentially, but then go out and do a four day trip and debrief. But processing was, uh, in a sense for me was making, helping people understand or make sense of what, uh, what was happening, what they noticed, what they're experiencing in themselves, what they're experiencing in the groups or with other people and, and trying to make sense of that. Uh, and it could be one and the same, but it's sort of in the moment, like what's going on for you right now versus let's look back at that. So, um, so understand then some difference between debriefing or after action review, uh, a more basic quality of simple reflection. Like let's look back at that and then processing, making sense of an experience, making sense of stimulus, right. Um, and so on. And then working a little further in, started within the wilderness therapy work, and then certainly dove into this largely with Project Adventure, um, getting into the experiential learning cycle, right? Maybe uh, I'll draw a quick diagram, just, I don't know, would that make sense? This might be sure. helpful. Um, yeah. All right, here we go. Mm -hmm. How's that? So just to recap, I don't know, is this coming in reverse? Because I won't do it if no, it's reverse. Great, yeah, it, it mirrors for us. It's reverse for you. Yep. So experience, 
reflection, generalization, And I'm going to change, I'm going to put what's typically here is application. So kind of looking at this cycle. And we might say up here, other experiences, and I'll move my hand in just a minute. Okay. A little scratchy, scribbly, but no worries. I it'll make sense. It's a visual. So we have our concrete experiences kind of couched in the experiential uh, learning, experiential education, moving through that phase of reflection uh, informed by observation. So observation, reflection, generalization, making meaning, and application, applying this learning to another setting, uh, other experiences, and so on. This is, in a sense, some of the things that we train to at Project Adventure. Um, where it was like, okay, that framework, there's kind of a classic response to this of the what, what happened, yeah. or what did you notice? And when we say what happened, it's basically what happened for you individually, what happened for you individually. So that's where it's more about what did you notice, sense, sensory based, the so what, right? So what did you learn from that? And now what? Now what will you do with that? And in some circles, that this is really familiar. It's interesting. I went to school for elementary education, and the first time that this was actually introduced to me was in my math for elementary class, where we were working with math manip manipulatives, um, you know, uh, Cuisinart ra rods, uh, power 10 blocks or whatever, and people were literally working concretely with numbers, like blocks. And... It was wild to watch a group of students, adults, uh, at non-traditional class in a way. It was I was undergrad, but there were other um, people further in their lives where they were just like, this is amazing. I actually understand subtraction or division, right? And they could see it. They were drawing it. They were, And I love the teacher. I'm forgetting his name. <laughs> it's been a while. But just wrote on the board that. So what? And people were like, what? So what? And he caught us in that moment around what's the big deal? Why are you so excited? And it was, it was done with a little bit of humor and a little flip. But the piece was, what's so important to you right now? So what a key thing with debriefing, right? Is what's so important to you, right? So how do you go through an experience and realize that aha moment, that moment that something lights up in with you and you understand it? So working with this over the years at PA, I mean, this is a foundational concept that we worked with there. So I worked with it a lot. After doing that over and over again, and part of what happens for me is, um, I don't know, I guess I would say this, is that sometimes I get bored. And that's something that I've known myself uh, for years. This is part of the why I do this work on the me side, is that it's varied, it's dynamic. Um, and I, I can remember years ago as a kid, telling my parents, especially my mom, saying, oh, I'm bored. And she would say, what are you going to do with that? Or go outside and play, you know, basically go figure it out. She didn't know in the construct of facilitation, but thanks mom. What a great tool. <laughs> <laughs> like, go figure it out. What are you going to do with that? At Project Adventure, um, what we were noticing, uh, I was noticing when I was doing more trainings, but still connected with the youth and college programs there is that some, some of the facilitators were struggling to connect and be effective with debriefing um, with school groups and then camp groups. And what was happening was, and I wrote about this in The 100th Monkey, which is a, a book that I published with Project Adventure, is that, I realize I'm gonna do a different color, that we needed a different framework. This is great. It's what did you notice, right? What did you learn? What are you gonna do with what you learned? How are you gonna apply it? Really basic, nice flow, three-step debrief and then actually uh, implement it or enact it. This piece though, we started to say, well, what's happening? And, and what was happening, youth facilitators were facilitating camp groups like they were school groups. School groups had um, goals that were things like, we want them to feel connected to each other, but we want them to communicate effectively. And maybe some were exploring leadership or um, being a member of a team in a classroom. Well, a lot of that was here in the learning place, the so what. 
right? But the camps were like, we just want them to have a good time, to have a memorable moment. So the layer with this is I came up with a concept of a recreational debrief, an educational debrief, and a developmental hmm. or a therapeutic debrief. Just leave with that. So recreational, you know, when we think about questions that might sit there for a debrief is what was the best part of today? What's the thing that you're going to remember most? What did you love? Or a sentence starter, right? Today, um, I, today I remembered when. It's all about memories, experience, the joy that groups had. So Nate, is that like a very literal version of recreation? Like recreate the experience that you had? Like, is that what you're trying to get them to do in the answers to their questions? Of I haven't thought about it that way. Is that what's coming to you right now? Yeah, yeah, which is interesting. I've never thought of that word that way, but it's like, okay, I want you to recreate like that feeling of joy or that feeling of like tension or that feeling of like um, whatever challenge that you experienced. Let's go with it. Okay, <laughs> cool. Because literally, right, a recreational debrief, it could be the traditional question and answer. But it could be draw the picture, right? Yeah. So kid comes home from that camp experience, or in this case, they were coming to a challenge course experience, and it's like, here's my picture of the awesome day that I had. Has nothing to do about what they learned. Has nothing about what they're going to do with what they learn. It's like, I had an awesome time. It wasn't like, you know, they could go here, right? Because hopefully it's open enough that they said, I felt really connected, and here's why. Or I felt like I felt heard, which – could be an enjoyable place, but that shifts here too, right? Yeah. You have something else to say? You're good? Go on. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, this is fun. So I love the idea of recreating that moment. So sculpt it, draw it, dance it, sing it, answer a question. Eh, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Recreational debrief, educational debrief, kind of traditional education, cognitive learning. And that's okay. this model, right? Because this is conceptual, abstract uh, conceptualization is what are we learning? Again, not asking anything to, anyone to do anything with that, but it's, what did you learn from today? What did you learn about yourself, your other people, about working as a team, about leadership, about communication, all right there. Moving forward is de developmental or a therapeutic debrief, right? Is now, as you actually apply, and I want to change this word. I get it. Apply makes sense. But for me, I want to go back to, this is, um, built on uh, Dr. David Kolob's work, at least who's noted for that. I don't know who else has worked with that individual. I don't know him myself, but Kolob's model, right? Is this, and Kolob's model is, is called active experimentation, right? So I wanna bring that back because I think apply feels like more definitive. Now that you know this, now that you know how to listen, you go listen. Now that you know how to lead, you go lead, right? Yeah. No, we want to experiment. So now that you know this, what happens if you try behaving this way, right? What happens if I, I actually try listening rather than talking? Or what happens if I take the initiative? What happens if I step out of my comfort zone? <clears throat> and that truly informs that cycle again. What did you notice when you did that? Yeah. Well, when I stopped talking, they started talking a whole lot more. <laughs> right, for working with facilitators that you use this, even with groups, it's amazing. So I want to put active experimentation here. And reminds us to, to truly be active in applying what we're doing. So I don't want to lose applying or transfer, but to me, active experimentation lights, lights me up more than applying. Um, and it, I think it's a little less threatening mm. in a way. Now, you can, you can insert goal setting here. You can insert intentions at this phase. But this structure um, helped me make sense of this a little bit more. It helped other facilitators at Project Adventure say, you know what? This is a school group. We're going here. Our level of questions in a debrief or a level of activities that we're doing in a debrief should land here. Camp season's coming around, we gotta dial it back. Or we're working with a, a group 
either a therapeutic group that has more substantial goals or we're in a longer term engagement, we're really going to work to this place. I'll pause, but I'll, I'll say that if you want, I can layer in a couple more pieces that I've already talked about that I've been messing with, active experiment, <laughs> actively experimenting with in relation to this, and it relates to debriefing in a way. But I'll pause for questions. <laughs> my, my first question, this is a process question, is Nate, are you OK if we go uh, like 10 to 15 minutes over our time? I'm good. I have uh, nothing at the moment, so. OK, cool. Okay. So that, that was my first question. Uh, are we already there? Uh, we have 15 minutes left, but we we want permission to like dig into this before kind of wrapping up. Cool. Yeah, you're so fun. Let's let's do this again sometime. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to. Oh yeah, we could definitely do a part two. Um, so the first thing that I'm I, I'm thinking of, which is it's not a question, but I'm just gonna say it to to just let you know where I'm at, is I think that this is also really helpful where certain facilitators or certain people really like living in certain spaces, right? So like I am a huge now what, so what now what person, right? And if if I had to do the just like what happened, like I'm probably a bad camp counselor. Like I would be, cause I would just be like, and how does that relate to life? Like you said, right? Like how I wanna get to the, how does that relate to life part? Um, and I think that that even highlighting this if people were like, oh, I really love those, like, so what questions. Like, I love digging into that. Or like, man, that stuff feels like really heavy. Like, I really just enjoy, you know, talking about like what happened and seeing what people say could also be really helpful when somebody's trying to assess like, am I a good fit for this type of program? Or am I a good fit for this type of group? Like, which ones do you naturally have a lot of energy around? And also, like, which ones are you going to be uh, unable to, to, to avoid, right? So, like, I shouldn't, I don't know if I think I should work where, where I need to stay in the recreation space because I'm unlikely to. Um, and that's what I was thinking about. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see, oh, go ahead, Nate. No, go ahead, Tim. Go. I was say, I'd love to see you layer in some of the other things that we are talking about. So I, I, I'd like to take you up on that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Meg, you were speaking specifically for yourself, right? Your preference is more in that now what phase, right? Active experimentation, integrate the learning, and right? Yeah, I, the, yeah, and the so what, both, but yeah. And so what, okay. And mm -hmm. how about you, Sam? I, I don't have a strong preference for any, uh, so I, I'm familiar with the old, like the original version of the model, and I've never had a strong preference. I think my my preference, or I think that where I get kind of like geeked out is on like really asking a question from this place of um, ignorance in the in the reflection or in the recreation st or recreation stage uh, and not knowing where we're going to get with the application or active experimentation phase. I find that if I can ask that first question and not really know where it's going to land, we do this activity in um, safe zone trainings a lot called privilege uh, privilege for sale, and I've been amazed at where people have gotten with the application stage. Like so many times that now I can just ask that that reflection question and be like, I'm so curious where this is going to go, yeah. and not be like, I know exactly where this is going to go. Oh, love it. But yeah, let's let's see some let's see some more layers. Yeah. More colors. <laughs> yep. More colors. I got another one. We got red anyway. Um, and I would speak to just Meg too. For me, it's um, I definitely enjoy cycling through and dynamically trying to understand what the the group's goals are. Right. Who I'm working with. Where they want to be. Also, leaving room for the moment that it, it could be a camp experience, but someone could really have something significant and powerful come through. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and holding that space. That's that um, phase that you were talking about before, right? That's that fourth phase, yeah. Yeah, yep. So for me, it's about being dynamic. And I think, as indicated by my, my first debrief tool in question, that my draw is when the group is ready, and this is about understanding, I might want to go here, but a group might be like, we're just here for fun, right? That my, my, the, the big reason of doing this work is that, right? Is that we can invite people to shift, make a choice for themselves to shift. And I, I want to be clear with that is I believe that I'm holding a space. I'm not making the change. That they're making the change. They're, they're experimenting. There's some level of accountability with this layer too, right? It's an actual action step. So either you do it or you don't, and people know about that or they don't, and so on. 
the layers, Sam, that for me, and this is newer, uh, hopefully it doesn't get too messy. We mentioned um, Simon Sinek's Golden Circle, why, how, what? And so this is why, right? So why is this important? There's significance here. What's the point for that? This is how. Huh. Yeah. Let me redo that. So it's basically, why is this important? Why is this helpful to know? Whatever. This is how. And this is loose. You know, I'm open to people pushing back and saying, no, I disagree. Or, yeah. But why? Well, how are we going to do that? Right? If you know this and you know it's significant for you, because this is about analyzing and significance, how are we going to do that to or even better with active experimentation, how might we do that, right? Like there are so many well, ways that you might be able to, using your, your question from earlier, right? Thanks. Wonderful catch. How might we, or how might you or I, right? How might I, with this wonderful catch there, Sam, in addition. This is why we do this, right? Yeah. Yeah. So moving up, why, how might we, to back to the what? Yeah. And I know Simon Sinek speaks about this as like the what is not a result. And I, I need to dig in that a little bit more, but flowing through this, I kind of want to say, well, this is what happens from that. And then we move back to an observation phase. It's not part of that piece, but it's observation, reflection, why, how, what? I think, I think the what is a result. So way back at the beginning, and I love when we can bring things back from the beginning, um, uh, is intention. So when you have, when you start with why, mm -hmm. and then you move into the how, then your what does become a result because mm -hmm. it it got it, there's an intentionality versus like if it's not intention when you or when you're literally starting with what then there isn't an intentionality so it's not a result right. of the why. But when you start at the bottom of the cycle and go this way, then I think what you're saying is spot on. Love it. Too. Which That's why I start with why. Yeah, yeah. And what's, you know, that idea of intentions, I think that so often the why doesn't change a lot, but the why does change when you revisit your intentions. So that I, that like fourth part might be about intentions, right? So that reflection is, so this thing happened. This is the what we have now. Were we happy with that? If not, maybe our why wasn't the right why, right? Like, so we weren't even doing a good how because our why wasn't the right why. What are our intentions for this space? So let's, um, yeah. Is, is this where we want to be? You know, I, yeah. won't, I won't go into the model with this, but it brings up choice theory and reality therapy, William Glass's work, and there's some others that relate to that is, is this where you wanted to be yeah. or where you want to be right now? If not, where do you want to be? Let's change it. Oh, thank you so one much. Other, one other layer with this, this won't be quick, is, um, and it's tying some things from earlier, was we did why, how, what. I also mentioned... Um, Learning, doing, yeah. and being. I'm still working on where these actually land. Yeah. And I'll add um, observing or noticing. So, so layer in that, this is learning. We're going to do something with that learning to the point where hopefully we are being it in our experiences, and we can notice and observe. And to tie it back into debriefing, because all this came from debriefing, the piece is if we, can, if we can work with our participants of its direct service, or if we train the, the, the facilitators that, we're gonna, that are gonna be working with other groups, if they understand this, that they can have awareness of themselves and others, they can say, what does that mean? Right? So the debrief, the, the more people know about the process, the more they can own it themselves. You know, if you bring in body-based awareness, somatic awareness stuff, right? Oh, this is going on for me. I'm noticing like my, my jaw clenching. I'm noticing that I'm getting embarrassed. I'm noticing ah, this lightness of joy. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? I learned something. I learned that in this moment, I was feeling this way or that way. What's that, right? Let's do something with that and let's be it. Whatever, you know, it's, you know, that's loose, but right. Well, yeah, I think it's great. I, I laughed because I, you said, if they can understand this, and I looked at that and I was like, 
maybe we need a bigger whiteboard. But yeah, it's amazing. Like it's it's both incredibly complicated and incredibly simple. Um, this you just kind of like blew up a model that I've known about for most of the time that I've been facilitating. You kind of just like exploded it, but it doesn't. It, it wasn't in a threatening way. I mean that it's those layers are incredibly helpful. The way I was thinking about it was if you drew the first cycle up that a lot of people are familiar with at, in a like a you know let's say you're doing a two day train the trainer, mm -hmm. and you draw that cycle up. Um, when you're starting to dig into like what is facilitation and how I'm gonna like move you through this, and you start and you say like okay, so like we're gonna get really familiar with this cycle, and then like when people are ready, you're like okay, we want to add another layer to it, and literally being like we're familiar with this, we feel comfortable with this, we feel like we've got a grasp of this, let's add this layer, and you could keep doing that every like two hours, literally being like okay, we want to approach this from a different framework. Let's talk about learning, being, and doing, right? Boop boop boop, and then. All of a sudden, there's this beautiful structure that you're hanging all of this nuanced layers of knowledge on, which I, that's why I think it's like, yeah, that's so cool. It's great. I'm with you. Well, yeah, thank you, Nate. Um, okay. So we definitely, will, we are, uh, we're going to move into what, what we call our final segment. Um, and we introduced this as being different only for one reason. It's because this is the one part of the show where we're going to ask you questions, and we're not going to ask follow-ups, or we're not going to dig in. We're just going to ask you a question. You can answer it as quickly um, or as longly uh, as you want. It's up to you. But we're not going to dig in. We're going to resist our urge. And, and these are questions that we ask every facilitator on the show. So these are our only scripted questions. Phew. All right. Ready? I feel like I'm like on a lightning round of a game show or something like <laughs> There you go. We, yes, exactly. <laughs> or whatever it is. We used to call it the lightning round, but we realized that that implied that we want you to talk fast, and that's not the, but yeah, <laughs> kind of like that. Cool. You don't need to speak quickly, though. OK. So our first question is, what are three words you would use to describe facilitation? This is where I'm thankful that you said lightning is not about being fast. Nope. <laughs> Um, three words for facilitation. Ambiguous. Considerate. And generous. If you could pick one ground rule to apply to the entire world that everyone in the world would have to follow, what would it be? You're going to have to repeat that one, Sam. I was thinking about my three words. <laughs> no problem. Uh, no, no, I was listening. Uh, okay. If you could pick one ground rule, uh, one group norm, one ground rule to apply to the entire world that everyone in the world would have to follow, what would it be? Uh, if it's just one? Yep. <clears throat> be present. Um, I do want to expand that. I know you're you're doing really well not responding back. <laughs> but uh, recently, so being present, I think that's so key. Um, and it's a it's a constant practice again. You know, those times where I know I'm present, otherwise not. Um, so I think that's the base of a lot of the ability to make decisions, right? In either reactions versus response, to be able to make choices that are going to be effective or not effective or helpful or not helpful and so on. I recently, when we talk about group norms or operating norms, um, um, get to see a friend. Oh, I'm, I might mess up his last name, but Alex VRL from Monterrey, Mexico. So Alex has a company called Odyssey Consultants. Um, and I believe, or just Odyssey. And Alex is amazing. And he led a piece on this, uh, a concept called the Tetra Map which is looking at earth elements and how people relate to those earth elements and how you can shift between the elements. When he introduced this, um, it was a brief like day, you know, a little longer, maybe three quarters of a day training. He introduced operating procedure, procedure, yeah, operating norms as um, presence, generosity, curiosity, and congruence. I just, I loved it because it says, you know, be here, be present with us, 
be generous. So share of yourself, right? Share how you're feeling, share what you know, share of yourself. When people are sharing, be curious about what they're sharing. How often we just want to say, well, and this is, you know, it's like, well, about me, or they should, well, that must mean this. It's, what does that mean? What are you saying to us? And then congruence was, can you have alignment with those three? But I think the key with it coming back to my first response was that it's about being present. Thanks. What is something you still need to be reminded of as a facilitator? Hmm. Um, there's a belief that I hold and I think groups that I work with remind me of this and it's a continuous challenge, but the belief I have is that, um, I believe that every single person has their own culture and certainly we can talk big buckets, uh, of where people are coming from, of how they identify, you know, just in, in bigger terms and social identities, what makes them up or who they are, how they might identify. But if you keep working into that person and seeing that person in the moment for who they are, right, is, is understanding that every single person has their own culture. And I don't know if that's accurate to say it that way, and I'm working through this myself. Um, and with that belief, the reminder is that either I'm understanding someone's culture, way of being, who they are, how they think, act, and interact, uh, well or not well and the the big piece is on that outcome is either people leave there feeling seen heard appreciated loved or there's a miss in those pieces like i don't think you heard me right and i say the word love because that's kind of ultimately with this work that i i think is important that um i don't know if for some love is like whew, that's a i don't know if we can touch that word but it's if appreciated is better to hear great but if, if we can leave a space where um, in some sense that's what people desire uh, is to, to be seen, heard, appreciated, loved, um, we can do a lot of good things from there. What do you do right before a facilitation? <laughs> might depend on the day, might depend on the facilitation. Um, There's days that I'm practicing this idea of arriving way ahead of time, even before setup time or things like that, and uh, either taking a nap, meditating, um, kind of resting. So one of those are all and above. Uh, sometimes it's the, uh, you know, just um, typically if I'm working with a group, I'm a little further away from my family. Um, but, but there are times literally where uh, – I just had an experience, you know, playing with Kai or Davina or with Michelle, and then I'm hopping into a group, um, you know, within a day or something like that. So uh, right before, yeah, it really ranges. Um, trying to think of other common things. But yeah, I think, I think the key is trying to leave a little bit of space before I go live, so to speak. Um, and then sometimes there's just flat out reality that, uh, I might be on a call. I might be responding to a text, you know, of something's come through that you need to manage, uh, and I'll gauge, does it need to be handled then? What will the impact on the, the group that I'm working with be? Can I handle that in that moment? Does it need to be handled and so on? So. And what do you do right after? <laughs> sometimes get in the, the car and drive home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that, you know, that's, for me, I mentioned the family and it's such a significant part. It's the very, um, like, I love this work. I love my family. The work can take me away from my family. Uh, and, uh, traveling, um, is both awesome and challenging. So sometimes when I'm done, it's how quick can I get back home? Uh, sometimes, and I'm still working on this, I've learned that, uh, it's not always about getting home quick, uh, because by the time you get there, you're exhausted and you're not present for your family, right? So, um, there's other times where I've been in a space where it's like, 
that was amazing. The space is amazing. I'm going for a walk. Um, you know, or it might be dinner with who I've worked with. You know, I mentioned this group. Um, uh, I don't know if I said this, but it was a group down in North Carolina and it wasn't planned, but they said, let's go to dinner after these couple days of a team building event. And it was just awesome. Like really personal, uh, conversations and yeah, so it can really range. And that might be, you know, same thing, socializing with other facilitators, colleagues, and so on. So it's a whole mix. Mm -hmm. What is a piece of facilitation advice you'd like to give your five years ago self? All right, where was I five years ago? <laughs> Kai wasn't born yet. Um, It'll be uh, similar to, to today, that's great, um, which is this work is important and you and your family are important. Take care of yourself. Can't wait to see this in five years. <laughs> awesome. Okay, what still stresses you out as a facilitator? Hmm. Two things come to mind. One is I notice that with most groups, I wouldn't say every group, if I haven't met them yet, there's definitely an anxiety. Would it reach a stress level? Probably depends on how I perceive the situation. But certainly there's this anxiety that shows up around, um, can I connect with them? Can they connect with me? Like, do we, do we relate, essentially? And how to build that relationship. To, to do the work that's uh, that's been called for. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that comes to mind is, and especially more now, having my own business with this, and I'm I'm living it right now, is that we've got a lot of great opportunities. And again, it's so mixed from working with the camps, working with business groups, training facilitators. You know, the that direct service cultural shift work or just team development stuff that um, to continue as an independent business owner to bring that work in and to do it in a way that I want to do it, um, which is really personal, is, uh, is how to manage the incoming calls, managing the program designs when I say, hey, I'm going to get something to you. Um, I know that there's a, um, I don't know if it's contractual trust, but when you say you're going to do something by a certain time, and if that happens, it's all good. And if you don't, does that jeopardize the relationship? Um, so I'm living in that in the moment that I have some proposals to get out, some program designs, uh, and and so on. And that's like, whew, okay, where do they go? Celebrating Kai's birthday this week, you know, leaving for Australia on Saturday. Whew, like, I guess uh, we can just say the happenings of life um, <laughs> and a little more specific facilitation. It's the prep work. It's the behind the scenes work that I don't know how many people know um, that goes on to get out the door to go work with the group. Yep. Sure. That's a, a unique answer, too. I appreciate that. Um, what do you do to manage the stress? Well... Um, the, this is the, go back to that comment for the five, the self five years ago currently and probably, well, hopefully not probably watch it. Uh, I was talking to myself. Um, if I'm managing stress well, then I would have taken the walk or I would have talked to someone just to verbally process an experience. You know, I was thinking about that. It, I wonder if sometimes too I love the a challenging moment or the reluctant or resistant person in a group or even group like where you're they're not totally in is and I know that takes a lot of energy um, and um, yeah the walking's helpful I have great reminders at home to do that uh, this is um, by default in a way and by desire um, but literally playing with Kai and at this point Davina uh, time for Michelle and I are a little bit limited, but 
uh, I was joking around from mowing the lawn to playing tag, which is really just running around right now with Kai. It's like, this is, it's helping me. You know, it was Kai, when Kai was younger, it was walking the stroller. The challenge for me is doing that personally and directly for me. Um, uh, my, the being state that I'm in often is I'm stressed. I'm going to eat this certain food, you know, so it's chocolate or pizza, it's comfort foods, which ultimately aren't helpful for managing the, the stress. So it's, uh, I'm in a, right now I'm doing 30 days without sugar. And other than, I guess, a little bit in this green tea that I was drinking, um, but it's, I've done that before and it's been really impactful. Um, so how to, how to maintain some of that um, would be helpful. Thanks. What is a unique place you facilitated? Oh, um, what is it? It's, uh, one place is the, um, I think it's a museum of art in Peabody, Mass. I think it's, a, I think it's an art museum. Um, and we were able to work within the exhibits. Uh, you know, so I did, uh, there's kind of a classic activity called mapping or world map where you can either place one object and state it as where you are and in relation. We actually constructed an entire map using large strings and there's a five to 10 minute initiative that we interacted with. So I threw ropes on the ground and said, okay, you've got five minutes, create a map of the world, which is hilarious because out comes, I don't know my geography here. And I said, uh, oriented properly. However, I didn't say which way north or south or whatever it was. But we did this in exhibit with all these world cultures represented in art. And then, you know, we played a, a game called the Worldwide Key Punch, which is a classic game, but built into this map, as well as just, you know, um, kind of classic map questions of like, where were you born? Or uh, if you could travel anywhere in the world, where would you go? Um, move to the country that best represents your personality or who you are. That was a fun one. It's like, never thought about that. And there, you know, so that was definitely a unique space. Um, and, and sometimes it's, it inspires activities, you know, mm -hmm. there was a, there's a classic uh, activity called elevator air, which kind of looks at recreating the space of being in an elevator where it's like, right? Look up, look down, but don't talk to anyone. Well, there was an elevator in the museum. Let's go do it in the elevator. And we did our three rounds. It's very funny. We're the last round of the elevator here. It's more about a lot of interaction and talking. So now we go from elevator, classic elevator, air, no one talks. Ding! And like, this is among other people. No one's talking. By the third round, we're coming out of the elevator like, ah, so good to connect with you. Great conversation. You know, it's like, oh, and then the last one, I'll just name it, inspiration from this space was not planned. We talked about operating norms earlier. And uh, there was an um, origami exhibit. And it just came to me that, ah, what a great opportunity for people to construct their norms the way that they want to be with each other uh, in the form of origami. So people thought of a value, thought about a way of being like a behavior. And then they had to construct uh, with large flip chart paper. So that size, a piece of origami for the group that would explain. And it was, uh, it was awesome. That's cool. Uh, Nate, what's a not directly facilitation related experience that you think every facilitator should have? This is a should question. A, a, like a non-facilitator experience that mm -hmm. everyone should have? Every facilitator should have. Every facilitator should have. Mm -hmm. um, given the philosophy of the facilitation work that I do in that we're that I'm often, and I say we, cause it's my work with other people. Um, I guess that the idea is inviting people out of their, to, you know, inviting to choose to step out of their comfort zone. Right. Which has become a little cliche at this point in terms of that idea. Of, and it, and it's important. It's become mainstream that, yeah, step out of your comfort zone and, so in a general sense, I would say anything that would help them step out of their own comfort zone so that they have that experience, um, you know, that, that it's a personal relationship they can have. And if we, if we speak to Brene Brown's concept of empathy is that we can find that moment in ourselves to empathize with the people that we're working with to say, 
you know, basically, yeah, I'm with you. I've been here. Yeah. You know, I know how that feels through my experience and let's be with this together. Cool. Thanks. Awesome. What book or books do you recommend most to others? And this is any books. Yeah. Can be any books. Uh, I recommend a lot of books that I haven't read yet. Part of that is because um, some of the book concepts I get from Google Image or from YouTube talk. Uh, so I think that's an important thing to know. Um, I do read some books, but it's not often. Um, I never read a book in high school, which again, I just I want to share this. I think in some way that's it's important to know. Yeah. Um, you know, for whatever those choices brought it, it, uh, it was an interesting experience. It, it, for whatever reason, reading didn't connect with me. There's certain books that grab me that certain that don't. Um, I think the book that gave me some confidence as a reader was Tuesdays with Maury. So it's a short read. I think for me, it was like, oh, I'm reading this on the plane. And I forget how long the flight was, you know, a few hours. And I was like, oh, I read a book on the plane. Wow. I'm generally a slower reader. It takes a while for me to understand. So uh, uh, not knowing where anyone else is at, I think, in, in the meetings from that book, I think were significant. So Tuesdays with Maury would be one. Um, sometimes something like The Alchemist. Um, hmm. Yeah, oh, there's, there's a lot, and I think it's it's so situational. I mean, oftentimes it's really about where someone's at in their life or whatever they're asking for. Um, and uh, for my capacity recently, it's been a little while since I've read, read some books. Again, it's more quick Google image, uh, YouTube, uh, Huck Finn, Adventures of Huck Finn. Cool. Do you have any online resources that you think others should check out? Facilitating XYZ, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> um, and I believe that that this is a it's a tremendous resource. I've personally just started digging into it. Um, you know, I've only watched a, a few of the interviews. I appreciate uh, both the full episodes and then kind of taking a, a piece out of it, so it's a little more digestible. Um, other on on online resources, uh, playmeo.com. And I know Mark Collard was on earlier this week. Uh, I'm flying to Australia Saturday to meet up with Mark for a couple weeks. Uh, I'm a contributing author um, and have been in a place of uh, thought partner in a way around uh, sharing some ideas that I think would be helpful there. Um, it, that's definitely a tremendous resource, uh, um, especially for activities and eventually for program design and we have high hopes for this. Um, beyond that, you know, I think there's a well-known TED, right? TED Talks, TED.com. Um, I mentioned just Google Image and YouTube. So if I hear a book's name or an author's name uh, or a particular concept or model, those are the two places I'm looking, Google Image and YouTube. Um, I think that there, there are a lot. <laughs> so another one, it's a little, a uh, little bit different. There's um, a person up in Canada, Joey Faith, Faith. I mispronounce his last name. Sorry, Joey. Uh, the physical is another one. Uh, and he's just, it, certainly it's phys ed focus. Um, but the games there are, are adaptable. Uh, and he's done some neat work to connect the phys ed community. Cool. All right. Yeah. The last one is one piece of advice that you have for anyone listening. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I want to ask the question of for those that are listening, what what advice would you give yourself? Or what <laughs> what curiosity? Uh, so maybe the advice is to ask yourself, what advice would you give yourself? And if it doesn't come right to you, um, to give it some time, because maybe that advice, that advice would come through at some point. Thanks, Beautiful. 
Yeah, you're the first person to facilitate that answer. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Nate. Nate, uh, um, for anybody listening, are you on like social media? Your, can you give us your personal website? Uh, can you restate the title of your book? How can people connect with your work um, if they if they want to do that? This, this is, you know. Yeah. You know, it's been interesting. Uh, after uh, <laughs> It's so weird. It's like kind of the perfect time for it to go haywire, but I can still hear it. It's working out in the electronic robotic speech. <laughs> I, you were still breaking up for me on the last one. I'm laughing because I really think that sometimes technology is just like you were supposed to end five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try one more time. All right, we're back. Well, yes. I guess here, here's the connection to that moment, for me anyway, was um, I started my own business, Nate Fullen Consulting, uh, last, the end of last January, so essentially the beginning of February. Um, and I had intentions to blog, to be active on Facebook and social media. And as life situations were, um, that hasn't happened yet. I would put it in the yet category. My intent is to, to have some more presence online. And at the same time, I've enjoyed also not being present online in a way. Um, the people I've been working with, a lot of it's been referrals uh, and relationships. And then when I'm in working with the group, oftentimes it's leading to other work, like, you know, in, in um, other opportunities in that realm. So how can people connect with me? Um, connect with me personally. Find me. Good luck. No, just kidding. Uh, it's um, the my website, which is basically uh, this is another thing I had intents to like really um, communicate through a website what it is that I'm offering, which right now has these big buckets, right, from training and workshops to uh, team development and leadership development to coaching and so on uh, and resources. That's natefolan.com. Uh, really the invitation is uh, to send an email or a phone call. A text works. You, you might have to identify yourself if you're texting me, if I don't know you yet or if I don't have you on the phone. Um, email is natefolan at gmail.com and phone number is 978-395-5174. Would love to hear from, I mean, really it's about whatever works for people to connect with me, what channel, um, and, and we'll go from there. Okay. Thank you, Nate. Oh, Megan, Sam, thank you both so much. What a, a again, so grateful to be part of this experience and to be part of the collective. Um, I certainly would welcome that opportunity to, to share time with you again at some other point, especially Great. when you uh, get through some other amazing people because there's a lot out there. Thanks, Nate. So, yeah. Thank you for holding this space. Absolutely. Thanks for being part of it. All right. We're going to sign off. And uh, we will uh, hope we'll talk to you again sometime soon. All right. Bye, everyone.